the road to Emmaus, one of those times when the risen Christ appears. Perhaps you're sat there this morning thinking, not another of these readings that we know so well. When are we going to have something new? We might just dismiss the reading. We've heard it before. We know the story. We know the expositions that preachers have talked about over the years. And then there's nothing new for us to learn. But I firmly believe that the Lord is speaking to us through these well-known passages that we've explored over the last few months. I think he's opening our eyes to new things, particularly in this season of shifting sands in the church and cultural pressure from outside to change the church. Going back to these well-known passages of Scripture is actually really helpful because it reminds us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We celebrated Easter just two weeks ago. It feels a lot longer, but it's just two weeks ago. And we're reminded that nothing on this earth can overcome the power of the risen Jesus. And that same power lives in me and in you. So I think it's really important that we spend time with these well-known texts. And that's why we've got the road to Emmaus today. It is a passage which Tom Wright describes as the finest scene that Luke ever sketched. And there is so much within the verses that Ted read to us today. In some ways, it's a preacher's dream because there's so many different strands that you could take. At the level of drama, it has everything, and it's a model for a great deal of what being a Christian is about from that day through to this and beyond. It really is one of those passages of Scripture that talks of our walk with Christ as a journey. It reminds us that He is with us even when we can't see Him. It reminds us that sometimes we are blind to what the Lord is doing, but He knows the bigger picture. It reminds us that sometimes we get caught up in our own little world with the blinkers on, Sometimes we get so caught up that we don't even see what's going on in the church. We just see ourselves. Sometimes we get caught up with just what's happening in this church. But we're reminded that we're part of a worldwide family. The story turns from slow, sad dismay at the failure of human hopes. Turn into someone who may or may not help. And then the discovery that in Scripture, all unexpected... They lay keys which might unlock the central mysteries and enable us to find the truth. The sudden realization of Jesus himself present with us, warming our hearts with his truth, showing us himself as his body is broken. It's a story that shows how things could be and shows us why We are Christians in the face of everything wrong in the world. Why we are Christians in the face of everything wrong in the church. And why we are Christians in the face of everything that is wrong in our lives. It's a passage that keeps on giving, no matter how we are feeling. Perhaps a question for us is, where on the road are we this morning? Are we at the start of the road and feeling downcast? Perhaps we've known Jesus, but we're struggling with our relationship with him at the moment. Perhaps it's felt like we've been blind to what he's doing for a long time. Like Cleopas, are we thinking we had all our hopes on him for this one thing, or these few things, and it never happened? But then we witness what had happened. Interestingly, at this point in the story where Cleopas is downcast, And Jesus appears. He doesn't know it's Jesus, as we told in the reading. He is very brave to tell that person what he is talking about. After all, we're told it is three days since the crucifixion. It is Easter Day. Or as we now call it Easter Day. We know from Scripture that the disciples are actually hiding in a room, afraid of the authorities. Yet here, Cleopas is telling this stranger that he had pinned all of his hopes on Jesus as be the one to redeem Israel. It's very brave. It's very courageous. In the midst of being downcast, 
he still says that what he had hoped Jesus would do. This, friends, is a further example of Luke's theology that Jesus dying and rising again is the start of a new exodus. The first exodus being the Passover, of course, and Israel redeemed from slavery in Egypt. What we're now seeing is Israel is being redeemed and God is purchasing their freedom. They would have hoped that Israel would be liberated once and for all from pagan domination, free to serve God in peace and holiness. And when we think in that way, in many ways, it shows why the crucifixion was so devastating. Why Cleopas is there, so upset, downcast, that this person has been killed, the one that they had pinned all of their hopes on. Jesus, the bearer of their hopes, was dead and gone. It was more than that. If Jesus was the one to redeem Israel, he would have been the one defeating the pagans rather than dying at their hands on a cross. Interestingly, Cleopas' statement only needs a slight change to be what the early Christians declared. In verses 20 and 21, he says, They crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. That's what he says. But shortly, that very phrase would become, They crucified him, and that was how he did redeem Israel. That's the belief of the early Christians. It's the belief of us. That is how he redeemed Israel. And the twist in that statement comes because of the resurrection. The twist becomes because of the resurrection, he redeemed Israel, just not in the way that the people at the time thought Jesus would. So Cleopas and his companion, who many scholars believe is his wife Mary, need to be prepared before they understand what has happened. In the same way, that Jesus has prepared his disciples during his earthly ministry. In many ways, as with the other Jews of the time, they'd been reading the Bible through the wrong end of the telescope. They'd seen the Bible as a story of how God would redeem Israel from suffering, rather than how God is going to redeem Israel through suffering. And in particular, the Messiah, God's own Son, who is crucified. The Messiah who is crucified and resurrected to redeem Israel through suffering is walking along the road, and yet Cleopas and his companion do not recognize the risen Jesus. It's a strange feature of the resurrection stories that Jesus is not recognizable at first. Mary thought he was the gardener. Cleopas and his companion think he's a stranger. The Jewish resurrection hope did not indicate that this would happen. So what we can see from this is that though it is Jesus' body, he has emerged from the tomb, has been transformed, yet it was the same. And perhaps that is a concept that we're never going to work out until we share that risen life with Jesus. He is the same yet transformed. We know God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But because they didn't recognize Jesus in the first place as that risen Messiah, they couldn't recognize the event that had happened as part of the story of God's redemption. So perhaps Luke is pointing us to say that we can only know Jesus and recognize him when we learn to see him within the true story of God, Israel, and the world. Perhaps that is where society in the modern day is going wrong. We've got consumerism and individualism, all this stuff that you need to have the best. It's all about me, me, me in society. People are searching for answers. People are searching for Jesus, yet they're not able to see him because they have lost the bigger picture. They have lost the story, the true story of God and his redemption. Perhaps when we say there's a lack of biblical literacy in the world, and dare I say it, in the church, there's more behind that statement than we realize. That lack of biblical literacy means that people are unable to see Jesus 
because they don't know that story of God and his redemption anymore. It doesn't roll off the tongue anymore in society. Those of us that declare it, we're known as the, the countercultural people or the Bible bashers. But that story of God and his redemption will enable the world to see Jesus for who he is. Perhaps the way forward in this changing world is to reclaim that biblical literacy from within the church so that the church can start acting as though it believes the Bible as the unchanging word of God and then taking that message into the world. Perhaps that's what we need to do. We need to start acting as though we truly believe that this is the word of God, as though we truly believe that it is the unchanging word of God, despite what culture and society says. And then we take that word into society. If we can reflect the true story, perhaps people will then start to recognize Jesus once again. Perhaps that's why Easter hasn't been as commercialized as Christmas. Eugene Peterson said this, it's interesting that the world has had very little success in commercializing Easter, turning it into a commodity the way it has Christmas. If we can't, as we say, get a handle on it and use it, we soon lose interest. But resurrection is not available for our use. It is exclusively God's operation. Now, I don't know when that was said. Tony Thompson posted it on Facebook over Easter, quoted Eugene Peterson. It is a Eugene Peterson quote. But it just made me think, perhaps because people don't understand that story of Easter, they think it's about bunnies and eggs and chicks. They can't see Jesus for who he is. Why? Because the church has not been out there declaring what Easter is truly about. Resurrection power is not available for our use. It's exclusively God's operation that lives in us. And perhaps because the world, because we don't understand that, people lose interest. It makes the point here, though, as we look at the road to Emmaus. The resurrection is all part of God's redemptive plan. And what we see here on the road is exactly that, with the question, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? What we need ourselves is the risen Lord to teach us the scriptures. Here in this passage, we see one of the most powerful encouragements to pray for his presence, a sense of guidance whenever we study the Bible. We need to be prepared for rebuke if we have failed to understand the reading. And we need to listen for fresh interpretation. Only then will our hearts burn within us when we too study the Scriptures. That's how we can know that God's Word is alive and is relevant for the here and the now. The Holy Spirit helping us to see things more clearly. Without the presence of God, the text is just that. It's text. It's a book. But when we study the Word of God with Jesus and the Holy Spirit bringing us the interpretation, we can see things so much more clearly. And then our hearts, too, burn within us as we study the Word of God. It should also not be lost on us that in this passage, it's the first meal of the new creation when they break bread together. The religious people of the time will have been familiar with the creation narrative of the fruit in the garden, the first meal in the Bible. And yet here it's the bread that is blessed and broken that then Cleopas and his companion recognize Jesus. It's through this remembrance of the Last Supper, at this point in the story, just four days ago, from Thursday, that they can see that death has been defeated and that God's new life has burst in upon the world of decay and sorrow. And we see the first sign of that in the risen Jesus meeting these two on that road to Emmaus. The first meal of the new creation is broken bread. What do we do at communion? We break bread and share it together in remembrance of what Jesus did. Perhaps as we break bread, we can see the risen Jesus, 
perhaps when we come forward, we can see him and our heart to burn in as he teaches us more about his way. The way Luke tells this story helps us to live in it ourselves. We too often walk along that road, as I said at the start, sometimes downcast. Sometimes we're in that moment where we see Jesus, we see there isn't Jesus. But nine out of ten times, we're somewhere in the middle of that. The downcast and, the, and seeing Jesus. We're somewhere in the middle. That's part of life. But what is also seen in this passage is that we too can allow Jesus to bring that fresh truth out of the Bible to have our own hearts burning. Now, I'm saying, and be clear, I'm not saying that doctrine is going to change and we're going to change everything what we know because the Word of God is unchanging, but it will bring fresh interpretation and fresh truth as the new revelations of the kingdom continue to be revealed to us so that we can then share that fresh truth with people outside who don't yet know Jesus. In the rest of the gospel, Luke is emphasizing what the church often forgets. The careful study of the Bible is meant to bring together head and heart, understanding and excited application. I think we as a church often forget that. We often forget that careful study of the Bible is important for us. It can happen when we look at the whole story from Genesis to Revelation. We see the story of God and the world, of Israel and Jesus, not in the way that culture wants to tell us, but in the way that God has sketched out. And I think that is another of the problems with the church and the world today. We have allowed cultural influence in the church, and it needs to be repented of. We have allowed culture to tell us how to understand this book. The only person that can tell us how to understand this book is the Holy Spirit. That's where we've gone wrong, friends. And that's what we need to repent of. If we don't take that threat seriously, we'll end up being a church of the culture and not the church of Jesus Christ. When we see Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament, when we understand Jesus as the person to whom Scripture points, not in the isolated texts, but in the entire flow of the story, then we grasp the true picture. Then we grasp the true picture of God's redemptive plan. Now, I know that that is a challenge in the modern world. There's so much out there that vies for our attention. Reading Scripture slips down the agenda. That's why I think there's so much dodgy theology out there that people then get on board with and go, yeah, that's right, I'm going down that way because that fits in with my life, that fits in with my views. That's not the case. There is one theology, and that is the theology of Jesus Christ, and that is what we need to hold on to. We don't go, well, I like that bit, but I don't like that bit, so I'm going to go with this theology. No. We go, that's the theology of Jesus Christ. That's the theology I'm following. Then we can be the church of Jesus Christ. Too many cultural influences in the church pull us away from Jesus. Biblical illiteracy pulls us away from Jesus. That's what we can see this morning. Are we willing to be a church that stands on the unchanging word of God are we a church that is going to follow the theology of Jesus Christ? And are we a church that's going to repent of the cultural influences? And are we a church that is going to become biblically literate? I hope and pray that's the case. Because then we can truly start to change society. We can truly start to be, as New Wine says, local churches changing the nation. And I hope and pray that that happens. Because, boy, does the nation need to change. For those of us in the church... I think this reading is a wake-up call for us. It's an opportunity for us to learn more about the power of the resurrection through Scripture, more about what we can do with that power living in us and starting to see more happening from within the church through the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can become something that people want to know more about. Are we guilty of making Jesus boring? Because he certainly isn't. If we start to represent the real Jesus to the world, despite that meaning as being countercultural, despite that meaning we will face opposition, then I truly believe that there is a hope for this nation and the world. Luke brings us back to the Last Supper with the breaking of the bread. He points us to something that will quickly become a symbolic action of Jesus' people. 
As we're told in Acts 2.42, the fellowship of believers devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. What we can therefore see is that Scripture and sacrament, word and meal, are joined tightly together here as elsewhere in Scripture. Tom Wright says that if you take Scripture away, sacrament becomes magic. If you take sacrament away, Scripture becomes an intelligent and emotional exercise detached from real life. But when you have Scripture and sacrament together, you see the center of Christian living as Luke understood it. And that is the model that we should have in the church today. Scripture and sacrament. There is one other thing that Luke shows us here, which again shows his masterful storytelling skills. This story is told as part of the entire gospel. In Luke 2, 41-52, we read about Mary and Joseph realizing Jesus wasn't with them. After three days, they discover him in the temple with the learned teachers. Didn't you know that I'd be involved with my father's work, he says? Here, there is a different couple at the end of the gospel. Likewise, at the end of three days of agony and mental anguish and spiritual searching, and essentially Jesus is saying, did you not know that I was doing my Father's work by going to the cross and rising again? I am doing my Father's work. The whole gospel story of Luke is framed between these two very human scenes. Luke has invited us on a journey of faith through the anxiety and sorrow of life to meet with Jesus who longs to share his presence with us. Luke is showing us the new exodus has been achieved through the cross and the resurrection. That victory over death has robbed the powers of their main threat. That sin and rebellion against God is defeated. That Jesus is leading God's new people out of slavery and is inviting them to join him on the road. This road, the one to Emmaus, is just the beginning. What we now discover is that we hear Jesus' voice in Scripture. We know him in the breaking of bread and that's the way of God's new world. That's what has been achieved through the acts we commemorate at Easter. So the question then perhaps for us is where on that road are we? When we come to communion, will we recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread? Or will we just come up to the rail, receive the bread and wine, because it's a done thing in church? I hope and pray, friends, that through the act of communion, we will all recognize the risen Jesus. We will start living for him. We'll become the church of Jesus Christ based on the unchanging word of God without cultural influences, we can start living for him and not the things of this world which will hold us captive. And then we can be a church that will change the nation. Amen.